I think we will start slowly. Welcome to our session. Um, thank you very much for coming. I hope you have enjoyed lunch and we will not make you too, too bored so you will not fall asleep. So today we are going to talk about continuous integration practices and some things that we have developed in our company and that we actually open sourced and how they changed our development life and how you can actually do the same for your organization as well. So let's start with introduction. Uh, my name is Yuri Gerasimov. I'm working in the company FFW. I'm working as the developer, technical lead, and architect. So I'm mainly involved in development. And this is my colleague. My name is Andrei Podonenko. I'm a DevOps architect, and mainly I'm a developer as well. Right, and let me do some introduction to our company. So we are a pretty big agency. We build a lot of websites, mainly in Drupal. And um, lately, the problems that we were facing, because we have so many offices and so many development teams, that every development team does their own thing. And uh, um, this is kind of join of all best practices across our company that we we're, were able to gather. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to do some retrospective of my career, and I have worked in multiple companies with different teams, and uh, each team basically works in their own way. And uh, I would like to talk about how that was and uh, how that involved to our continuous integration workflow. So, usually development in Drupal has two pieces. So the first piece is the uh, database, and we know and we love Drupal because it's so configurable and flexible, and at the same time we hate it because it's so hard to move the configuration around. So one of the um, one of things uh, that uh, we need to take care of in our development environment is moving database. Another thing is the code, of course. Uh, usually development infrastructure for small teams and uh, some agencies is that we have one development environment. And what means that there is some server, it can be within the company office or it can be cloud solution, it's somewhere where all developers are working with. So they do all their configuration there. Uh, when they uh, work with the code, somehow it's got updated. And this environment, it has, um, it's pretty easy to set up, and there are multiple ways you can work with it. So uh, sometimes you have one big server with multiple projects on it. They can live on the same domain, but in subfolders. Sometimes it's the um, different domains, but the same server. But anyhow, physically, it's the same equipment. Um, also, some companies using the other solutions that are on the market, for example, Acquia, Pantheon, there are multiple providers that have some support for development in Drupal, and this support is that you can have production environment, development environment, staging, so you have some tools to work with. When you work with the code, well, when we used to work with the code, um, I'm coming from time when we were working with CVS a little bit. I mainly was working with SVN. And because it's the tool that it's much better than, of course, pushing your files with FTP. But still, it didn't have that flexibility of working with branches. So basically, everyone was just like pushing their code to master. And it was like pretty fine, pretty convenient. Um, if, especially if you have some sysadmin in your team, they were able to have this post commit hooks in your repository. So every time you push some code to the repo, it got reflected on the dev side. And that is working great when, before you actually start facing some problems. So some of the problems that you can have. Um, when you push the code, it has some bugs. And in this case, you really need to fix those bugs before doing the release. And uh, we sometimes were able to manage to get the code to the state when it's stable and we 
we're not pushing the broken code to the master branch, but still, if the sprint is pretty long or functionality slips into multiple sprints, it's too easy to make some bug in the beginning, and then in the end, when you need to deploy to staging environment for the client to test, you find out, oh, we have some bug, and it's like not very good for client to see. So you're really failing the deadlines. Or, of course, you can work overnight, and it's pretty stressful fixing bugs, and you can plan your sprints to have like, okay, we develop five days and then three days fixing bugs, or maybe two days, depending on how good your team is. But still, it's, you, you put yourself under risk. And this is something that is not very good thing to do, and especially nowadays we have some tools that help prevent this. Um, another thing that is important in development process is actually code reviews. So it's like the very first and probably the very best thing that you can do to improve your code is to make the code reviews within your team. And uh, this is pretty hard to do if you just let everyone to commit to master. Because you can do the code reviews, but you do it after things got committed to your stable branch. So in this way, you probably can catch bugs, but you cannot prevent them to slip into your code. And also, it's kind of like you cannot block the bad code getting into your master. So you don't have any mechanisms to actually prevent that to happen. So still, you can organize your sprints to have like one day refactoring, two days bug fixing, and then you are like semi-ready to get for the release. But still, it would be much nicer to have something like you block your bad code to get in. The database. So database is something that we all dealt with, like in Drupal 6, Drupal 7. Uh, we, of course, can use like features, but not everything can be exported there. So we used to work with, like, let everyone to configure just like everything on the dev side. Again, that works fine until somebody actually breaks another person's work. Like, it, and it's very easy. Like, uh, you can have a view, you can have multiple view modes. Oh, not view modes, displays, right? And then uh, somebody is working on one view, somebody's responsibility in another display, and then it's very easy not to check the option to override the settings on this particular display, and here we go. <laughs> you have damaged the work of other person. And it's very bad to notice that, actually, when you are in the end of the sprint and you are doing deployment for the staging. So that's one problem. Um, another problem is that when you would really like to experiment on your local environment and then push everything to staging, dev, and production, um, you can do this, but you need to repeat all the actions there. Or you need to play with exporting to features. So um, in some cases, you... If, well, the recipe, if you do any configuration on a dev environment, you basically do it wrong. You will you will not let other people to review your work because they will review only your code changes and uh, you really cannot increase the code quality. Some things that we improved in this process, we were able to deliver some scripts to actually pull the database from dev and staging environments to the local environment. Uh, but that was actually it. Usually we just install backup and migrate and uh, it was working fine. Just remember to disable it on production. Some problems when you have single site that, I mean, single server that you're working with on your project. So because you can have multiple projects, they are actually sharing the same resources. If you have, like, one team, that's fine. If you have two teams, probably it will work. If you have, like, five, ten teams working on the same server, they will start fighting for the resources. That's for sure. Uh, a lot of projects, they need migration, for example, and you need to rerun migrations time to time on your staging environment. This is pretty intense process. It can put your resources down. That's like one thing. Uh, another thing, caches. So sometimes uh, you work with memcache, right? And uh, if you have multiple sites working with the same memcache instance, of course, you can have like keys and stuff to separate caches, and that will work. 
but <laughs> you will definitely find the person who find more convenient just to restart memcache on your dev server to clean the caches. And that's like, <laughs> that's like not that bad, but sometimes you will just put other teams a little bit down. They will have some lags on their work. Uh, the worst thing is the Apache Solar. That's the thing that actually eats memory. And if you will let other people to like do some manual configuration, they will need to restart Solar. And if you're indexing all your content during the migration and they restart Solar, it will just fail. So you will have some cases when you will really start fighting with other teams like you, you don't have granular control over your development process. Um, it's getting very bad when we are talking about varnish. So if you have varnish configuration, it's getting, because varnish is configured like globally per server, uh, it's, it's very easy to mess it with other projects. So especially when you have multiple, multiple sites that need different configuration of varnish, this is just like, it's, it's very hard. So if you need to configure varnish, it's much safer to just go to different server. That's, that's for sure. Um, another problem that is not very technical, but it's more organizational wise, because usually when you have one server and you can really mess with other teams work, you usually have like one person who is a system administrator of that server who don't give any pseudo rights to any other people, uh, maybe team leads, but he is the man who actually manages everything. He knows the configuration. He knows the implications of changing them. And he's doing the releases to other environments. And it's all good if he works fine and he's capable to work over times and things like that, but it's very bad if he got sick. So <laughs> if, he, if he got sick, like all your team, all your teams even, they just cannot do any releases. And he's like single point of failure, like your actually development server. So uh, this is the practice that you get into in this environment and uh, like other developers, they will not like to get into this and then you are in trouble because of you have only one person. Well, if he will get sick, it's like he can work from home and stuff, but if he will resign or leave the company, it will take some time for the new person to actually understand the things because there was like 99% no documentation, so that's like normal. And I would like to talk what we have changed in our development workflow. So things that we have changed. Uh, the local environments. Because every developer has his own preferences in like what operating system to run and things like that, it's sometimes very hard to have some consensus of, okay, we have our development environment, PHP 5.3 or 5.4, and then local environment of that person installs with PHP 5.5 and he doesn't really want to spend time backporting the ports and alternative sources and play with that. And uh, another person can have one, ver one version of solar and libraries. Oh, it's even worse when it gets to the SAS compilers. I'm, I'm personally not a big fan of finding well, with fighting with all those dependencies. It just like fails for me. But it's lack of my knowledge. So. But <laughs> I know that team members can have similar problems like me. So like when you start having these issues with multiple environments, you start spending time like running around and making sure that everyone is working at least similar environment. And if you find the bug on staging environment, it can be replicated on other environments as well. So that's like problem number one. Uh, problem number two is actually introducing new people to the project. This is something like, we have big teams, right? We have like 400 developers, like huge. And when our team is like, I can see that, oh, we are failing in reaching the deadline for the project, I start shouting and running around like we need developers and probably in a few days I get someone. 
And the deal is usually, okay, this person is coming in, like how much time you need for him to help you. And you say like, yes, like probably one week. And then he starts working on a project and it takes like two days for him to actually set up the environment. And this is something that is very bad. So we have switched to using virtualized environments. So we are using Vagrant boxes and uh, we develop the set of scripts that let you set up the Vagrant box. So we don't send the box itself because it can be like five gigs easily. And we have remote teams, so <laughs> passing five gigs, or especially updates to those five gigs, that will take same time than just configure the stuff from scratch. So we just have configuration in, um, uh, we used to use Puppet, but now we use Ansible, but it doesn't matter. I mean, you can delete your box, you can restart it, and it will configure it for you. So that was like huge improvement, especially joining people who are using Macs, Linuxes, Windows, different versions of Linux, like everything. That was great. Um, currently, we're using uh, Ubuntu 14. Uh, we used to use Ubuntu 12, uh, but like it really depends on what your requirements are. In uh, our open source project, this is just by default. But in Vagrant, it's pretty easy to change the version. So um, it's mainly, so this decision was made because we are using Debian on production environments, but, uh, and it was just working fine on Ubuntu, so we switched to it. Another thing uh, we have changed in our development environment that we don't do any database changes in configuration, like none. And it's very important to have that because you can actually do the review the code. You can see the conflicts of the developers if they are touching the same pieces of the site. So we are using, of course, like features and we use hook updates. It's all this code-driven development model that is around since, I don't know, a few years already. And this is very important. Another thing that we do, we have two kinds of development workflow. So when we start project from scratch and we don't have any content, we start with installation profile. So we develop everything from scratch. We just reinstall the site all the time. So every time I do commit and push the code, and if it's got merged, it will be deployed to the staging environment. It will be reinstalled from scratch. This is very convenient, much better than just pulling the database around with the content. And so in this case, we take care about the demo content. We can control it. Usually, we don't use the same demo content across the project. So we try to get images from the old website of the customer so they can feel that it's something that they are going to get in the end. And we sometimes pull the content from their existing website. or. If, they, if their business is, I don't know, about stocks or some nature, we just put pull articles around and they can feel that demo content is relative. So, and, and regarding the content, we deploy it from the code. I know that there are multiple solutions there, like features UID probably you heard of, and uh, there is others, like demo content something, but after, like, if, it's, if the website is simple, like just nodes, not that many references around, uh, exporting the content into features is fine. When you're getting a lot of references, especially entity references, and like taxonomies and taxonomies with other references, like you can have like, multiple relationships between entities, this is where you really need to control much better how things are working. And it's, you will get the bugs in uh, feature CUID. So currently we just use our own code, so it's just the module, and using hook install, we just deploy all the content in the way we like. Uh, and another thing, if you're using Panelizer, uh, that's probably only the way to go. Code. Um, this is probably the first thing that we have started actually changing. So we really like to work with the GitHub, and the best thing that we have there is actually pull requests. So with GitHub pull requests, it's very easy to do the code review. So, and that's like the main idea of this workflow. So we're using pull requests, and for every pull request, before it gets merged to the master, we do the code review. 
when projects started, usually like team lead do the code reviews in the beginning, like to ensure that architecture is like followed. Uh, but currently we have all our team members pretty mature and everyone understands how things should work. We have some kind of standards. So everyone is doing code reviews of his colleagues. Um, also we do the code style checks and test runs. So on every pull request we actually check if the code style is met. We use the Drupal coding standards and if something is wrong we just post the message about that problem and person who is creating pull request, he needs to fix them before actually asking anyone to do the review. Uh, we do the security test, so it's another scanner. What is important for the code review? Uh, code review can be pretty painful, painful in the beginning uh, because it's like we are all friends, we are all colleagues, but when we start pointing fingers to each other, like this code is bad and this one is bad, like people can get it a little bit personally, especially, oh, like if we are colleagues and we were working for a long time, that's like perfectly fine. We will have a beer on Friday and like all problems with code reviews are resolved, right? But if it's like new person coming in from the other team who doesn't know these guys <laughs> and then first his pull request get like 10 code reviews reports and he will like, oh, probably it's the wrong place for me. <laughs> so. It will take some time, but that's like really a good way to improve the code. And especially when you have experience from the other teams. Like very easy example, like uh, uh, there are ways of, like if you're building multilingual website, you build it a little bit differently than you build like only one language, right? You take care about the references, you make the decision about whether which model of the translation you're going to make. And uh, you need to remember wrap everything in T function and things like that. When you don't do this and you don't have much experience with that, probably you will miss a couple of points. If you have another person who is coming in and doing code reviews and he has his experience and yours experience, you really will exchange your experiences pretty fast on the code level. So this is a very good thing, not only for the increase in the code quality, but also for sharing the knowledge. So we had some cases when the people from other teams were getting in and they were telling like, yes, that's good, but it will not work for multilingual side. And like, we have this problem. We build the website. We were working on it like for a year and a half. And now they ask like, oh guys, can you translate it in Spanish? Oh yes, no problems. And like, that's the moment my problem started, right? So because we were not following some practices and we didn't build this multilingual websites, we had the issues, so it, it's very good to share the knowledge in the code reviews. And you need to be open for the code reviews. So it's, it's not about just like saying to the person, oh, this comment has typo, or you need to be constructive. So remember that if you are pressing too hard on that person, he will do exactly the same to you. So like this is kind of balance we already have on our team. But you will, if you don't do code reviews, this is something that you will need to work on as well. Another big thing that in our process when we do a pull request, we actually, in, beside of doing all these checks and code reviews, we actually build the website in specific folder on the build site where people can actually go and test how things are working. And that's great for multiple reasons. So, First of all, the person who is doing code review can ensure that things are working. And then we also can let our QA people to, to, to check the site. And this is when also we are removing a lot of things out of the release cycle. Because like one developer sees the ticket, he usually like if ticket has like five points, he got overexcited about the first three. He implements them, and two others he just skip. I mean, he's so happy he managed to solve this hard problem. He pushes to the pull request, and he has another colleague he's, <laughs> who is also a developer, right? So he will read it in exactly the same way. So he will be very excited about the first three points and the problem that is being solved, and nobody will take a look at the fourth and fifth. And QA person, on the other hand, he, he is not excited. I mean, it's just like a piece of functionality he needs to fix and to check. So he will be this boring checking every single step of test process, and he will catch bugs before you actually merge them to the master. So allowing QA on builds, that boosted our quality level pretty high. 
some monitoring that we are using on our build servers that when, when we work with them. So we do the monitoring, so we use Moonin. Uh, we also deploy, we are working with Darkware a lot and uh, with other hosting providers as well. So we have some boiler code, uh, boiler plate code to deploy things to Acquia. Um What we also do on our servers uh, and in our workflow, we do the visual regression testing. And I will talk about this a bit later. And uh, also we check when, after the big migrations, we also check if the site is actually working and all URLs are working on it. Because sometimes when you migrate like 50,000 pieces like of the content, you will not notice of this infinity redirects. This is kind of nasty problem and some other things as well. So visual regression, this is the tool that we are offering as the platform. It's available on the internet. You can log in there and give it a try. Basically what it does, it creates screenshots of your web pages, the ones that you have identified, or we can scan your website on four URLs. And then you can do comparison of the screenshot sets. So you can do the set of screenshot, you can do the release, you can do another one, and you can compare them, and then you will see what pages have been changed. Uh, also, a nice thing, you can actually compare the environments. So you can do the set of screenshots for your production, for your staging, you can compare them, and then you can find what changed. Um, this is something that we are using currently on our projects, especially during the releases to staging and then to production. And you're welcome to register on the site. You have like 100 URLs free and give it a try and let us know what you think. Maybe we, we will definitely improve on it. Uh, also, you can do authenticated users, some like HTTP access, pass through. So a lot of use cases covered. This is how diffs look like, for example. Uh, some URLs health check. So this came from the problem when we had to migrate the old website that had a lot of images. And this website was about nature and birds, and people were so excited about like birds and like uploading huge photos to the website without thinking that actually 20 megabytes picture embedded to the page is not the best idea for your mobile phone. So. When we migrated the content, of course, we pulled like everything. And uh, we needed to check these 20,000 pages, like if actually we imported something bad with these huge images. So we wrote a scanner that was checking the responses of all the pages. We were, we were analyzing the sitemap. And uh, we were also evaluating the size of each page with the all inline images, JavaScript, CSS, all together. So we were able to actually find those 20, 30 articles that were like too heavy. And uh, it's written in Go language, and it's like 100 to 200 lines script. So if you have some large migrations, give it a try, it can be useful. And uh, now we are going to talk finally technical. <laughs> And uh, we will talk about the actual technical details, how you can uh, install and use the CI box. Uh, this is the solution that we have uh, open sourced. And this is what's something that Andre is going to talk about. Thank you. Hi, guys. So welcome to CI box. Uh, you can follow the presentation by just going to this link. It's a link to GitHub repository where you can check the files that I'm going to talk about. So, what is CA Box? It's not an application. It's really a weird product because currently it's a bunch of scripts that uh, was hardly tested by our team for a lot of projects. And it consists mainly from two uh, parts. These parts are Ansible playbooks. If you are not uh, familiar with Ansible, it's a provisional tool uh, that uses YAML for uh, scripting, very handy uh, style, like uh, name, of the, uh, name of the step and command that should be executed and conditions like when it should be executed. So, uh, uh, CA box consists from two uh, 
two parts. Like uh, the first part is the script for spinning up your continuous integration server. Uh, along our uh, development process, we decided to have uh, one server for a project. So when we have a file ser uh, file projects, we have a server for every project itself. And with Jenkins Box, you can just run it with small configuration changes, and in approximately 15 minutes, you will get totally working uh, Jenkins server with pre-configured uh, configs. And another part is uh, actually uh, project tree initiation uh, playbook that will prepare for you right now by default is Drupal 7 with all the files in it, uh, like uh, the scripts that uh, sh will be used for uh, provisioning, for uh, running tests, for installing your site. Uh, so, how to deploy this uh, pro product? Well, this, this product is like an infrastructure installation product. So, first of all, you should prepare your server. It can be server like DigitalOcean uh, instance, for example, or you can use your internal server, hardware server, or even virtual machine based on Ubuntu long-term long -term, term support release. You should uh, change uh, two lines like uh, IP address of the server and run Ansible YAML. That will prepare all the software uh, into that uh, box. Uh, next, uh, second step, you should uh, initiate your project. Well, if you start your project, you will start from the uh, Drupal, like Drupal core then you will put there some models, but from start it's like an empty Drupal with Baptic theme. So this uh, github.yaml will just uh, grab the latest Drupal from Drupal.org, put there all needed scripts that shipped with our product, and uh, you will just need to git in it and git push it to the GitHub. It can be private repository, it works fine with them. So, and another, and the last part is you need to make change to Jenkins, like put the credentials to GitHub or API key to HipChat if you use notifications and vice versa. And after one hour, you will get totally working uh, infrastructure that will do all the stuff you already talked previously. So what we currently ship with Jenkins Box, it's like a lamp, lamp stack uh, with optimized configs and SSL support. Uh, we have there a bunch of sniffers with standards from, you might know, the model coder. Uh, we check in compass files by using SSS lint. It's like a, a big pain for our front-end developers because they don't, don't like this tool, but it helps us to improve a lot uh, of um, quality for the front end. Also, we are using uh, security linters. Uh, then uh, you will get the uh, stable version of Apache Solar with already pre-configured Drupal configs from Apache Solar model from Drupal.org. Uh, Selenium and Behead testing. And uh, also, after more than a year of development, we shipped the pre-configured MySQL config because you know that uh, you need to obtain results from scanning and uh, build site very quickly because you shouldn't wait for a build site for one hour. Right now, our uh, Drupal sites uh, spin it up with from one to 10 minutes. And of course, the Jenkins with needed plugins and pre-configured configs uh, as well. So when you first open uh, the Jenkins UI after provisioning, you will get only a few jobs like uh, pull request build builder. Actually, this job will do all the stuff uh, around uh, handling new pull requests within GitHub. Uh, also, there is a skeleton for uh, deployment plans like out of the box, you will get ability to test a current master branch by putting the IP address of your server slash demo 
and there will be always latest version automatically rebuild it by uh, if there are any new changes to master branch and also you know that servers uh, that are using for CI infrastructure is not so large and if there is no more space uh, there is a server cleaner which will uh, trigger the space script and uh, clean up all the tasks uh, one time per day. And uh, about uh, project structure. We stick it to some uh, structure that is uh, very similar like to the structure that is for Acquia, pro pro uh, Acquia hosting. Like you need to put all your Drupal files into doc root and uh, we have all our provisioning tools for the grant machine uh, in, inside provisioning uh, folder and there are some tests you can put the behead testing that will be executed on if you will select optionally for every builder or even only for demo site and there is a vagrant file with config so uh, when you start to work with a uh, new project, you will just need to clone this repository and press Vagrant up. And uh, in the middle, there is a list of scripts that we injected into the Drupal uh, code base, like reinstall script, uh, sniffers, tests. So these also are uh, Ansible playbooks. Uh, that lives with the Drupal code base in your project and uh, they will be used for uh, running all that stuff with spinning up build site, running tests, running sniffers for GitHub. And inside DevOps folder uh, we have refactored our code base for ability to approach not only Drupal, like Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, it's a totally different systems. And if you want to work with Drupal 8, you just need to provide uh, some environment variable in a uh, new Ansible script, like uh, in Drupal 7 you need to clear cache with one command, in Drupal 8 you need to use another command. And all other stuff is just going to be used as for both system as we equal. And a few words about Vagrant Box. Right now we decided to use same uh, scripts for spinning up CI server and for local environment. Like uh, we have to be confident that the sole server in your uh, local environment is totally the same that will be used for testing uh, builds on CI server. And it should be the same as for production server. So uh, we use uh, same scripts for, uh, for provisioning our local environment in remote environment as well. And you might know that some systems like Windows didn't like uh, Ansible and we are using a trick we put in all the Ansible uh, scripts inside virtual machine and run them there. So now you can use our Vagrant box like in OpenBSD even because if you can start Vagrant and virtual box, you will definitely get a working version of virtual machine. So just Vagrant up and you are ready to go coding. Now let's talk a few words about developer point of view. When you start work f first time with this system, the first touch to continuous integration will be like this comment. In uh, you prepare and pull request and in two or five minutes you will get comment like this with links to sniffers uh, that uh, uh, were run on uh, over your code with JS hint and the last link is the link to the build site itself. So uh, you can open this link and test uh, how your code work uh, on the similar environment as you, but uh, if there are any issues, you will definitely catch them there. And uh, how it looks like a big, a big picture. So you get a new task from your team lead and you start coding, adding files to repo. Right now we decided to 
work, uh, every developer has its own fork of main repository. It's more secure uh, because sometimes developers just JIT push and overwrite master uh, uh, branch. So now we decided to use a uh, new fork for every developer and uh, developer can do everything he wants in its own for, uh, his own fork and uh, can break master branch. After that, developer, when the task is finished, uh, he prepares the pull request and here is the part where the CI server starts to work. CI server uh, grab the code and prepare everything you seen on the previous slide. Then developer should wait for the comment, check if there are any issues with sniffers, linters, if there are, uh, if there are issues he should fix them, and after all the issues fixed, he should send his work to uh, another developer of the team and to QA for testing if the task was done as it is expected. And if everything is fixed, after that only the task can be merged into master. And there's a very uh, nice step that we uh, added to our process is the steps for review. The guy who knows how the uh, feature, some particular feature, works is a developer that, uh, current, that definitely did this code. So uh, we decided to create some administrative step like creating steps for review. For example, if you work on some uh, slideshow, you know how to check it. For example, you just write this receipt like go to this, enter this, save the data, and you should, and you should see this. And with these steps for review, uh, all, most of the bugs uh, catch it by developer itself. And uh, after, and with these steps, uh, project managers uh, are very happy because uh, for pre during preparing to demo to client, they just copy paste these steps and uh, uh, there are no bugs because everything already tested by the guy who did the code review, the QA, and the guy who did the uh, task as well. Next, how CI works. Uh, it's a bit of technical information. Let's imagine that you are Jenkins server. So when uh, there is a new pull request uh, on GitHub, Jenkins uh, has a custom plugin. We have made a few changes to the source code of that plugin for ability to post all the links to uh, GitHub comment. And this uh, plugin triggers. He found that new pull request is coming. Uh, then uh, he runs, this plugin uh, runs uh, the script. The script reinstall.yaml. This script is in the code repository. So uh, uh, after that, after he runs reinstall or sniffers, depending on your configurations, you can uh, at first run sniffers, but after that, if there are any errors, you can skip uh, running build because if you want to get results uh, fast, for, for example, if your project is huge and rebuild takes uh, a lot of time, you just run sniffers and if, and if there are any errors, you stop there. But uh, usually uh, after sniffers, we run in reinstall and uh, right now I'm talking about profile-based flow, when you reinstall site from the profile in Drupal. So the reinstall part is uh, like Drupal uh, site install and profile name. Then if the project uh, builds successfully, then there are test scripts that uh, runs, and if there are any issues, uh, you will see the link to test results. And uh, also the Jenkins can uh, handle comments. So you can uh, talk to Jenkins, like if you want to get two or three builds, two or three different sites for this pull request, you can just write 
retest this please, retest this please, retest this please, and you will get three links to unique sites for testing. And also, uh, we have a SQL-based flow. This flow is more uh, universal because you know that only Drupal has profile installation. And if you need, uh, there is a part in uh, every project, there is a point in every project when uh, content managers become to put new content into the uh, site. And you can't just reinstall your site because content will be lost. So uh, just by changing one variable uh, inside reinstall.yaml, you will get an ability to uh, change the reinstall part with a different uh, kind of uh, installing, like grab the database from production, uh, import it into the unique uh, database, run registry rebuild, clear cache, change variables, uh, clean uh, sensitive data, and vice versa. And all another part is totally the same. So this workflow can be used even for non-Drupal uh, CMSs, like we, we used it for uh, Symfony, for Big Tree CMS, for WordPress, anything that will fit requirements like PHP project and database for it. And uh, during using this workflow, we got some rules. Uh, like uh, one day we uh, faced it with issues that GitHub blocked our uh, bot user. Bot user that it is a user that using for posting that all that messages to your project from continuous integration server. So we decided to have uh, bot user per uh, per team. And also, uh, we are using one CI server per project because uh, when the project is uh, uh, in the final phase, you can know that uh, you know that uh, there can be 50 or 60 builds uh, per day, so it's really busy and not convenient to test uh, sites on this server when you are trying to use multiple projects for one server. Also, uh, there is a rule for development like you never should merge your own pull request because you will break the rule of manual code review. Uh, also, you need to add steps for review because it help, helps a lot for QA, uh, minimize the time for it. Uh, and. Uh, uh, for some teams, uh, we are using a uh, uh, selection of who will do review for your code, like for round robin uh, principle, like uh, for one task I'm selecting first guy, for another task I'm selecting second guy, because uh, we, we want to improve knowledge sharing in a team, and it helps improve a lot. And also there is a rule, never push directly to main repo master, right now GitHub uh, started to have an option for protecting uh, branch, so this rule like can be uh, enable that checkbox and everything will work okay. Also, there is a tough rule like you need to keep two siblings of every role in your project because when you have one senior and one junior, it's not an easy for a junior to review the code of the senior. His uh, hands will be <laughs> like this. And uh, uh, for responsibility, it is better the, uh, when you will uh, assign a task uh, of a bug to the guy who did review for the code. This improves responsibility a lot. And few words about responsibility shift. You might see you might see that uh, all the scripts that are used by Jenkins are inside the project doc root. So every developer can create pull request with like adding new step to reinstall script. For example, for cleaning some table or enabling some model. And uh, after merging, every everyone in the team 
after pulling the code will be user will be used this script. So you don't need to have ops in your team. Like ops guy is the guy uh, that knows uh, really well how the servers work, but he doesn't know how the development is going. So he is not aware of what uh, the phase of the development. That's how we uh, decrease in a gap between dev and ops. We uh, grow in a lot of DevOps in our team by using this workflow. And of course, like every product, uh, this product has bottlenecks. Like uh, we have dependency from GitHub. This CI can be easily uh, cha changed to use for GitLab, Bitbucket. We already created a plugin for Bitbucket for ability to post the, that links for comments. So when GitHub is down, you can do only local development without code review. And second bug is if CI server down, uh, teams get stopped on the pull pull request, uh, pull you know, on code review step. So you can continue to work, but uh, you will uh, have no that convenient feature like build. New developers should follow the rules. Uh, Yuri said a little bit about that, and it can be really tough for new developers because there are a lot of rules. Code quality should be really high, and if developer is not is not familiar with this, he will be really confused. And uh, DevOps must be a team member. Definitely, because our developers should be aware of how Jenkins working, how Solar working, and uh, this can be not so easy to approach for small teams. Manual review, manual code review is like a battles. Uh, sometimes we have a battles between our developers because one like this, another like another code style, and there are a lot of talk talks between developers. Also, there is, a, uh, there is a place where we need operations, like when we work on a really huge projects, when the database is two gigabytes, importing the database every time when the build is coming is a tough task. So uh, here where we need an ops for, imp for improving the process, maybe preparing database removing some of data, and et cetera. Uh, by using virtual machine, uh, there is a requirement that your local develop development machine should be really decent because uh, virtual box use a lot of HDD uh, and it should be really performant. So SSD is a must. And for project managers, with this flow, uh, there is no way to assign a task for five minutes because when developers start to work on a project, he, he should pull the code, run the vagrant app, and if he has no latest updates, he, he should run vagrant app provision. So all the uh, software should be reinstalled into the virtual machine and only after half an hour he will be ready to work on a task itself. So after that, it's a code review and so on. So minimal task is really one hour. Overall, overall system is pretty complex because, uh, well, uh, right now CI box contains approximately 50 technologies and it's not easy to understand how it works when you see a lot of scripts and Thanks to our awesome team, we, right now we have a nice wiki with quick start and you can follow the steps, but anyway, it's really complex. And it's not so easy to start for new small teams, like if you uh, have a small workshop, it can be really hard to change your uh, workflow to use CA box. But there is a way to start to use it, like uh, not use all the project, but only some parts of it. Like you can use reinstall script for running it, uh, for running it to reinstall your site locally every time. 
It's, it's really handy. Or if you want to put into your process tests, you can use test scripts. And or even Vagrant Box, if you don't want to use all that CI infrastructure, you just need a good working virtual machine, here it is. Uh, and of course, uh, the best way is to contribute to CI Box because when you are contributing, you learn a lot. And for, uh, for the DrupalCon Barcelona, we put an effort and made a stable release. So we stick it to stable versions of plugins, Jenkins, polish it a lot of stuff, uh, remove it, uh, abandoned code, and right now uh, you can just try it and it's really stable, it has, we believe it has no, so much bugs. And here's a list of what is included in release. And upcoming features. So right now, Acquia deployment plans are ready to go, but they not, they still not merge it into master, uh, into master because I'm not happy with them. They are not so universal like we are expecting. And some of our projects are using Gulp workflow, it's for front-end. Like you don't need to recompile every time your SAS files. You can just uh, install that workflow. Uh, it's not complex, but it helps you a lot to speed up all the process of front-end development. And uh, we want to create something like legacy CMS integration. For example, uh, I've uh, been involved into in integrating Big Tree CMS. Nobody knows about this CMS. It has maybe 10 installs, but uh, it takes for me uh, 20 hours to for adding it to CI box, like changing the environment variables and to put in database backup, and everything is going just smoothly. And of course, if we have some projects on Drupal 8, and uh, CBox works well with Drupal 8, but right now Drupal 8 is not stable, so we are not included all that scripts into the stable release. Here you can uh, see a lot of presentations we've made in different uh, events, blog posts, and of course a link to Wiki that is well organized. And I guess that's it. We are ready to answer some questions and uh, invite you in uh, 15 minutes uh, will be uh, both about best practices of continuous integration in room 132, I believe. So welcome to our both as well. Yes. Right now we have, uh, it's about Git flow, yes, a, a question. So right now we are using uh, different branches for different environments, like master branch is for development environment, a staging branch is for staging environment, production for production. So when we uh, want to deploy the code from master to staging, we just create in pull request, wait for all that sniffers, and if everything is okay, merge it to staging, and after that, the copy of demo job that you might see on my uh, uh, on one on my presentation, it just looks for change in uh, staging branch and run deployed to environment. That's all. We have a microphone there, so this session is being recorded. If you have questions, maybe it will be a good idea to talk to microphone. Or we can repeat the question as well. Is this one working? Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, I was going to say thanks for uh, sharing this information. Um, the first question I had was about the security tools that you run, um, some sort of a security audit that you mentioned at the beginning. What are those tools exactly? So right now we're using Drupal security uh, rules for sniffers. Uh, it, it is used for uh, approving applications from sandboxes on Drupal.org. And another tool is Drupal model uh, security checking. And I believe that's, that's it for today. And I'm assuming they have some sort of like uh, maybe a drush command that you run on the command line and it says 
yay or nay, right? Yes, security check-in model is, uh, has its own Drush command, and its command uh, written into the sniffers uh, script, and it just shows you the link to the log of output of this command. Okay, thanks. And the second question is, I saw there is this output from uh, something called a PP bot on GitHub, right? So it reacts on a pull request and it basically outputs, you know, the result of all the checks. So is this included in the repo or is this something homebrewed that, you're got, that you guys are using? No, um, this, this is not included in the repo. It, uh, this comment is uh, just a file that is forming every time you run the uh, build. So when reinstall.yaml uh, runs, uh, all the output of it put, puts into the uh, comment info.md file. This is the part that we uh, made by ourselves to improve the Jenkins itself. And after all the steps are done in, uh, within Jenkins, this comment just, uh, co this content of this file just copies to the GitHub comment. That's all. So yeah. it's, not, it's not a bot, it's just, it just basically sends through like GitHub API, it just sends this code. Yes, it yeah. just sends through GitHub API. Yeah, let me add on this a little bit. So that's a standard Jenkins plugin that is GitHub integration. And the way it works, you need to provide the user that, will gen that Jenkins will use to actually check if there are new pull requests coming in. And that's the, the name of the user. So it's not something extra that we have developed. We just call that user ppbot. And what it does after the jobs, it just can output the content of the file to the comment uh, stream. And that's what Andre has explained. We just build that file and it's got uh, displayed there. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, if you have any specific questions or you would like to see a demo uh, and, or have really like hands-on session, uh, the both will be the best idea for you to come. And thank you for coming. Thank you for coming.